So let's do our little bit. It's a tiny bit, but it will have an impact. Okay. So let's, we've looked at what happened here in this country with regard to the Leicester issue and the appearance of this trope of this hate speech, this uh, vilification by association. Let's look at the record of this terrible person and this unbelievably um, horrible party, this BJP, this monster that is uh, destroying freedoms in India. Here in the United Kingdom, we have a population of some 68 million people and the governments are elected by tiny numbers. And in fact, the current leader of the, the Conservative Party was elected by what, 81,000 people? Now, this is the level of democracy that we're talking about in this tiny little in, uh, island called uh, uh, the United Kingdom, a population of 68 million. And yet democracy is great here. You know, everything is fine. Nobody is pointing fingers at the British democracy. Let's have a look at India. And, you know, in terms of scale, in 2014, the, those who were eligible for voting were some 554 million people. Okay. So let's British Isles. Okay. And every member of that population is eligible to vote. All right. Out of that huge number, can you guess how many people actually voted or came out and voted for the BJP? Right. 180 million came and voted for Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the BJP. And those elections are the biggest elections, I think, uh, in history. Uh, some of the statistics I remember at the time, just jotting down, um, there were 1.4 million voting machines. Just get a, a scale of how many voting machines that there are in an election with 1.4 million voting machines up and down the country. And yet nobody found fault with the election process. It was an unchallenged and accepted as a valid exercise in democracy. And that has never happened in history. Never have 180 million people came out and gave one person and the party that that one person represents such a democratic mandate. It hasn't happened. It you know, happened the, again. They won a second time with an even bigger victory. It dwarfs um, Euro-Christian um, democracies in a, a totally different scale. I mean, in 2019, I think there were 600 million people who actually voted. So that's 10 times the population of these British Isles, right? Who actually participated in the democratic exercise. And of those, there were 230 million who voted a second time round to support Prime Minister Modi and the BJP, okay? And if you are going to sort of point the finger of fascism at this party, what you're actually saying is one of two things. Either the Indian voting public is not sophisticated enough to recognize that they have a fascist at the helm and that we European um, observers, we know better about these things. So we can say that you've got fascists, but you don't even know. You know, it's that colonial sort of superciliousness. That, that, that's right. Either you're saying that, right, or the statement you're making is a falsehood. It's not borne out in reality. It's not borne out in fact. And if we sort of explore a, uh, a little bit further, I mean, 229 million is if you take everybody in the United Kingdom, 70,000 of them, uh, 70 million of them, and let's assume that all of them voted unanimously for the leader of a political party in this country, you would still have less people voting for that leader than Prime Minister Modiji has got. Okay? Yeah, it's just, yeah. And so, you know, suddenly you start to think, well, hang on, this is like a mosquito sort of biting an elephant and claiming that the elephant is somehow, you know, in some way, shape or form, not up to its standards. I suppose even mosquitoes have uh, uh, psychoses. Uh, maybe that's, that, that's also possible. But that's the reality of it. That's the figures and that's the scale of what has been achieved. Not once has he received a democratic mandate, but twice and an increasingly democratic mandate. And so how does that conform to the dictionary definition of fascism? It doesn't. In fact, the opposition party the Congress Party, when it imposed what they called the emergency on the Indian population, 
when they imposed forced sterilization of citizens, those are the actions of fascism. Right? Let, let's be sort of really clear. Those are the actions of fascists. So we have a European um, political class and their um, paid-for media all shouting fascist, fascist, Modi, Modi, BJP, um, Nazi, and so on and so forth, whilst their own history is littered with the actions that are consistent with fascism, even in the 21st century. And on the other hand, we have a Congress party which actually inflicted a fascistic approach and control on India, also trumpeting the same um, repeated statements. And then on the other hand, you have a, a party which the people have repeatedly voted for. They appreciate the scale of what the people have done. And they themselves are rewarding a democratic government with um, a vote and a mandate time and time again. And this is so difficult for the Western power structures and media structures to possibly swallow that there are these funny brown people with this Hindu ethos who are doing democracy better than we've ever done it. They're out democratizing us. And, you know, how on earth can we complain? Well, let's make a some sort of a, um, a name calling, identitarian politicking, and we'll use that to besmirch their reputation. But it's not working. Um, I watched in the United Nations General Assembly some speakers from a number of countries who very warmly expressed how much they appreciated the support that India, that Prime Minister Modi, that the BJP gave to their nations when they were struggling under COVID. Remember, India gave 70 nations vaccines and not at profit because Prime Minister Modi said, we cannot profit from the suffering of other human beings. You know, this is Vasudeva Kutumbukum, the, the, the world is one family in action. That's not the action of a fascist. You know, that's not the behavior of a Nazi party. Uh, and you know, I think um, there were several South American nations who had been threatened by Pfizer and some of the big corporations in America. Um, the demands had been made that we need to be able to have bases in your country in order for us to give you the vaccinations. Now, that's the actions of a fascistic mind. That's what a, a fascist really would be. And in this world, even today, when I sort of spread my vision across, there are many countries which have the authoritarian command governance profiles associated with fascism. You know, we have the World Cup coming up very soon in Qatar. And Swedes have just announced that they're going to protest the absence of human rights and the prevalence of a slavery uh, means of uh, control. And they're going to do it by toning down their shirts and their jerseys and not take their families over there. I mean, this is the nature in which the, the West finds it suitable to, to protest um, when the substance of fascism is there, if not the label of fascism. So I, I think many of these things into account, we have a slightly different story being played out. Absolutely. Going back to some of the things that you said, um, you've expressed how Modi, Modiji is very dharmic with his Hindu values, not charging people for their suffering, helping. So basically, if we go back to Hindutva, it's actually quite the opposite of fascism, don't you think? Let's uh, repeat that so that those who are hard of hearing and hard of comprehension understand it clearly. Let's say that Prime Minister Modi, the BJP, are Hindutva parties. This is the allegation. Their actions are to supply 70 countries with vaccines at cost and not make a profit. That's not fascism. That's the antithesis of fascism. That's the opposite of fascism. The actions of the BJP are openly democratic. If they're not democratic, then find somebody else who has done democracy better. Find somebody else who's arranged for over a million voting machines and repeatedly has uh, received the democratic mandate from the, the nation. That's Hindutva. Remember, in, in Hindutva, the foundational principle is that to be a human being is a good thing. It's a divine thing. And that in each of us, there is a spark of divinity present. And that the body is just clothing. That but the beautiful part of a human being is that little glimmer of divinity that is inside of us waiting to be recognized and waiting to find articulation. And if that's your vision, and that's what Prime Minister Modiji's policy internationally has been, then that's Hindutva. And you're absolutely right. Hindutva is, by essence, by tattva, and in action, the complete polar opposite 
of fascism. So basically, we need to reclaim the word Hindutva. It's a beautiful ideology, but it's been tarnished as something very negative. We need to own that and and make it clear that Hindutva is actually very beautiful and it's all encompassing for, for the whole world. Like you said, he's helped 70 countries with Hindutva. Well, I think we do need to reclaim it. And one of the ways in which we reclaim things is to deny those people who have vested interests which are not aligned with our own well-being, we deny them the right to define it. This is fundamental. And remember, in the West, a person can happily say, I identify as this pronoun. And it's accepted that they have the right of self-identification. And if you actually then dispute it, there are people who have denied a person's claim to be identified with one gender, and they have suffered as a result. They've lost employment, uh, they have been brought in front of um, uh, statutory and legislative uh, bodies. And that's because they have a right to self-define. Like in many things, Hindus have that same right, but we're denied that right by people who seem to assume a higher moral ground and say, we can tell you what Hindutva is. We will define it for you. Allow us to create the straw man. And then we can give that th straw man a damn good thrashing at every opportunity because we know when we hurt that straw man, it actually vilifies and besmirches you. They have no right to do this. Nobody has that right to do it to each other. You know, Hindus, we don't do this. We don't go around and saying, oh, you're Republicans, and therefore, you know, here's a, a bogeyman that we're going to create to, to harm your vision of what existence is about. And yet there are very aggressive, undemocratic, fascist ideologies which say we have the right to define your identity for you. And if that isn't authoritarian control, if that isn't the seeds of fascism, then what is? So those people who watch this, if you're not part of the Hindu family, you have no right to define us anymore. You know, in uh, colonial times, that was something you appropriated and stole, um, but you do not have that right. It needs to be returned to us. Only Hindus can define how they wish to live in their homes, their nation, within their families and their communities. And if it's not causing anybody else any difficulty, then what business is it of yours? Yes, I, I, I think you're right there. They can't seem to shake off the shackles of colonialism. <laughs> where they have to you know, pigeonhole hold us still and label us and brand us. And no, thank you. I am a Hindutva. I'm a proud Hindutva. It's a beautiful ideology. It's a beautiful philosophy. And we can see the positive effects of it. So I think, yes, we should all wear it with pride and on our sleeves and reclaim it back. Well, there are 70 countries, as I've said, at least, who have appreciated the principles of Hindutva being present in the manner in which diplomacy is now being conducted. And so those who are challenging it, those who are wanting to vilify us on that basis, they're actually engaged in a losing battle. In the end, what is real will surface. And we have this as a, a national sort of a statement, don't we? Satya mevam jayate, that which is real will persist, will survive, will be victorious. And as the truth of what it is, what Hindutva really means, from a Hindu's point of view, Hindutva is Hindu nas. That is exactly what the word means in the vocabulary, in the language in which that word exists. And so Hindu nas is our right to determine and define what it is, nobody else's. And it is a good thing, in the same way that we believe that every human being is divine and capable of living with harmony, so is every single person who adheres to or follows or explores or relishes or even inquires about the Hindutva way of looking at things. It is Hinduness in action. And Prime Minister Modi, the BJP, and indeed the RSS, they have always acted according to the principles of Hinduness. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad, Namaskar.